Hello and you're very welcome back to the Public Eye Business Podcast brought to you by Granite Exchange. I'm your host, Sarah Travers, and throughout this series, I'll be speaking with local entrepreneurs and business owners to learn more about how their companies have come to be, to gain insight into their growth and find out how they continue to innovate. So wherever you get your podcasts from, remember to keep an eye out for all new episodes and subscribe to stay up to date. Well, today I am so thrilled to be joined in the studio by Catherine Mernon. Catherine's the founder of the Wellbeing Pathway. And Catherine, you're you're no stranger to this studio anyway. You've got your own <laughs> podcast you record here too. That's right, Sarah. Strange to be on the other side today. I'm sure. And we're really excited to, to hear all about your business. Before we begin, I'm going to give a little bit of background on Catherine and her business. Well, Catherine is an award-winning facilitator, a coach and and founder of the Wellbeing Pathway. She brings 20 years experience in leadership and well-being roles with a particular interest in women's health. Her health and well-being programs together with her facilitation work and her keynote speaker roles have allowed her to share her experiences with a global audience. A business graduate from Ulster University, Catherine also has a postgraduate qualification in mental health, a diploma in coaching and mentoring with the ILM, and holds a health promotion certificate from the Open University. She's undertaken a wide range of CPD in psychology, leadership, mindfulness, and as I said, women's health. Catherine has recently become a certified breath laugh and relax coach. So we'll be asking her all about that one as well. Now, Catherine lives in rural County Down with her husband, has three grown up children and is the author of Wisdom of Wellbeing and host of the Wisdom of Wellbeing podcast. Catherine also was the curator of the first ever TEDx event in Newry, Mourne and Down Council area, bringing speakers and audiences together with a make it count theme to support wellbeing connections and storytelling across the places where we live, work and learn. A huge introduction, Catherine, (laughs) but you know, well-being is at the core of everything that you do. Has it always been or when did you decide, you know what, this is what I want to do? It probably all, always has been, Sarah, and you've said there in the intro, which is lovely and does give the credibility to the, the business about my qualifications and experiences, but it was really about 12 years ago when my husband had a cancer diagnosis that I started to, I suppose, really explore what did well-being mean to me as an individual. And over the years, I'd been really lucky to meet people at really difficult times in their lives. And I noticed as I watched, listened and observed how they were able to either have a really good outcome or a poor outcome, depending on who was around them and what their well-being practices were. So at that time, when my husband became ill, he recovered really well physically, but it took a huge toll on his mental health. And as a self-employed builder, he really struggled with that. And I was looking after our children at the time. I was also managing a huge change process in a UK-wide organisation balancing all those balls and I became unwell myself. So then I had to practice what I preached Mm. and that's when I really started to explore mind body connections and how to live a really good life. So how did you find your personal circumstances at that time? Really the fact that a business has been born out of a traumatic experience but at what point did that happen in, in your own recovery journey? So I suppose I really noticed that for me, as someone who was educated, articulate and able to navigate the system, that I struggled and I started to think about how other people who maybe don't have that opportunity, how they were struggling too. So the idea for the business came probably in and around that time, but fear, imposter syndrome and all the associated things there, particularly in the female psyche, prevented me from actually taking that a step further. I then did develop around 2018 a health and wellbeing programme for people with cancer in my local community and that was the catalyst because I was nervous about doing that and one of my friends said you're going with the ego here, stop thinking about you and think about the other people and when that happened and I set up the programme people came, it was a snowy January night, it was blowing a blizzard and I wondered would people turn up and they did and actually Margaret Ritchie who was our MP at the time came to support the event just because we were local women 
and she was then diagnosed with cancer shortly after that. So that really started the belief in me, I suppose, Sarah, and the fact that I could see the positive difference whenever I brought these people together into that room. But it took another few years. And it, uh, yes, and, and what happened then? <laughs> <laughs> so I, again, probably listened to the ego and uh, secured a director level role within a large organisation in Northern Ireland, which was fantastic. And I loved that senior leadership, developing um, pathways and supporting a large team. But there was still that real, I suppose, desire to get the messages of well-being out into the community, out into the business and out into the places where we live, work and learn. So I had done some research. I'd set up the website I'd registered with HMRC, I'd done a lot of professional development, but there was still something holding me back. And I will talk about the role that you played in building my confidence then, Sarah, because I remember the media training that I did, which I still say (laughs) I was absolutely rubbish at. But there was a, a message you gave me that day about the power in when I was giving a message out that I maybe didn't fully believe in or that I felt a bit compromised. There was a lack of passion, a lack of motivation there. But when I started to talk about the stuff that actually made me feel a sense of purpose, made me feel that I really was in the place that I wanted to be in, that's where I felt alive. And hence, I took the next step. And it's quite remarkable. That's where I, I don't think <laughs> anybody realises at any point, you know, in, in a day-to-day situation Maybe the impact, I I don't think it was me. I think it was a realisation that you came to that day. But you were also dealing with very challenging times. You were leading an organisation throughout the COVID period and an organisation that was caring for an awful lot of very vulnerable people who'd been affected by COVID and and the impact of long COVID. So, you know, I can hear you thinking, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. And all I can think of is that huge responsibility that you had on your shoulders. That's true. That's true. And I suppose on reflection and the work that I do in myself, I kind of feel sometimes when you're in a role where other people are looking up to you to make those decisions and to lead them through challenging times, you just do that automatically. I suppose you have that value space and you keep going. But it's only afterwards that you actually reflect on the detriment that that was maybe to your own health and well-being. So that was a little bit of a disconnect for me sometimes whenever I was trying to support, lead and guide very much with that focus on health, well-being, balance, resilience, growth, development, all of those things that are so important. But how was I actually living those myself to be able to lead and have the best life that I could? So there was just so much, um, I suppose, unfurling of me as an individual. And a lot of that is historical and layer after layer of being a, a woman in the countryside and growing up with all the belief systems that, you know, were not serving me well. But at this stage in my life, I just feel so grateful and so, I suppose, empowered to be able to share that message widely with the audience that I have through the Wellbeing Pathway. I was going to ask you, where do you think the imposter syndrome or where did those negative beliefs about yourself, where did you feel that they came from? And had you always got the self-awareness about where they came from? Or is that something that's that you've only found later in life? I think, yeah, it's, it's something that I only find when I started to work on me. Um, I mean, I've had a really happy, happy life, but I suppose I like education, educated in a um, all girls, non led grammar school, um, also living in uh, a rural community. And I think that, you know, not getting above your station and um, maybe following a, a, a journey that other people before you have followed. Also, um, I was always a bit of a, a kind of a mess or a bit of a tomboy. And I think, you know, it took me a while to actually believe that I could be on that world stage, that I could hold a business and be seen as a credible individual and not lose the fun and the, the kind of um, childlike uh, approach that I take in life sometimes too, because we all need to connect with different levels and different parts of ourselves to live a really good life. And that's the thing, because I think work has become so serious or people when they're in their workplace feel that they they can't be mm-hmm. their true self because yeah. everything must be serious and there are serious repercussions if you mess up or you fail yeah. is that something that you felt I think I did feel a bit of that and that has been so powerful now in the work that I do with leadership teams because it's really interesting there 
you know, whenever you come in and you're talking maybe about developing a culture of well-being, for instance, and people around that table have their roles, so they're maybe director of or senior lead in or whatever, and that's amazing. They've got really good qualifications, credibility. But when I start to ask them about, well, what else do you do? You know, what do you like to do? It takes them a wee while to actually come up with a response for that because they seem to have a role and they forget that outside of work they are maybe a volunteer, they're maybe a football coach, they're maybe a singer in a choir. And when they start to bring in those skills, that part of their personality, that authenticity, authenticity, yeah. oh my God, they add so much more of a dimension to the actual team that they're in. And that has a powerful ripple effect right across the organisation then. So I'm dying to hear more then about the services that you offer at the Wellbeing Pathway. So what is it that you actually go in and do? So there are three main areas to to the business at the moment. Um, So the first one is coaching. And I I suppose for me at the moment, that's around facilitating coaching conversations, largely with managers who are maybe managing teams under that wellbeing culture. And it's very easy to say, develop a culture of wellbeing. I mean, there's still a lot of um, people think about it as a fluffy thing. Mm. It's all about people having yoga on a Friday you know, fruit baskets and um, time out. It's not that at all. It's about the health and well-being of our individual teammates and our staff as a whole and how that impacts on the productivity and the performance of the organisation. So those coaching conversations enable managers in a safe space to explore, well, what does that look like for me? How can I support other people in their health and well-being if I'm maybe struggling myself? So that's really, really powerful work. Alongside that is the consultancy part of the business. And that can involve engaging with staff teams to just identify where is your organisation sitting within a wellbeing culture? What does that look like? You get the warts and all scenario there. And then as an organisation, if you want to take this seriously, how do you act on that? So I would help them to build a wellbeing plan for the future that's evidence based and data driven so that they can see the results of that. And then the last part, which is the bit, I suppose, that I really started on and that will always be the the fundamental part is the workshops and the programs because I write those obviously with an an evidence base but I deliver those in my style and that's what I love to do bringing that energy into the room with people. It's incredible what you've actually built and and the need is there and just to go back to what you talked about going in and having those coaching conversations or or then just looking at the culture of an organisation Um, There are a lot of organisations out there that think they're doing it really well. And you said there's warts and all conversations that need to be had. How do you measure the culture of an organisation? If we say we do this and we've got a brilliant workplace culture, how do you show that perhaps there are cracks? Well, I think you have to be really basic here and listen to your staff. You know, there's no judgment comes with anybody who's already started things because starting something is better than not doing anything. But I think sometimes because people see well-being as a fluffy add-on, they maybe go down a route that doesn't um, have the outcomes that they intended. So when you bring that back to asking your staff, what is it like to work here? You know, where is the psychological safety? Is it um, a really safe space for you to stand up and say that you don't agree with something, that you maybe want to challenge something in a respectful way, that you feel there's no opportunity for growth or development. Also, what is it like to have those conversations with your colleagues? Do you feel it's an inclusive space? Do you feel that it's somewhere that if you do raise something that you're going to be really valued and listened to? Is there fun in your organisation? Now, this isn't about everybody running around in a lovely bubble and having the greatest crack every day. Toxic positivity. Yeah, (laughs) work has to happen and Mm. the, the, the KPIs have to be met. But the evidence would show if you have a healthy, safe, happy environment in the workplace, people will stay. People will go the extra mile. There'll be greater team cohesion and that will have a benefit in all your stakeholders and the outcomes of your organisation. And have you seen the transformation of organisations when they adopt this policy? Because it's it's challenging for both the leadership management, but also for the staff to say, gosh, am I really going to call something out here? Yeah, I have seen it. It is really hard and it is not a slow tick box exercise. And I think that's the thing where some organisations maybe struggle where they think, you know, we'll do um, a one hour lunch and learn or have a, a, a three week programme. The organisations that I've seen who do this really well is that they listen to the staff. They put plans in place. They connect their culture of well-being with their overall strategy, their values and their behaviours. They 
they review it, they bring other people in to guide them. And when the things aren't working well, they change that model. But I mean, it's it's not a standalone. It's a fundamental part of the organisation. And in this society where we're changing, adapting all the time, it's those resilient, happy, resilient space people are going to be the people who actually do well at the end of it. It's a tough time for leaders and managers, isn't it? I mean, when you are recruiting and you're wanting to retain staff, um, it requires vulnerability. And yeah, it can be a bit of a lonely uh, role too. Mm -hmm. Where do they go for help? Well, that's where I think, again, all the different levels of the organisation coming together and certainly through the wellbeing pathway, the offer that we bring to having those safe, supportive conversations because there is that view, I think, out there that leaders have it all sussed. But often, you know, leaders are sometimes thrown into a role or they, yes, go for a promotion or they decide that they want to have this specific part in the organisation. But that might have been OK 10 years ago where you could have had a five year strategy and it was unlikely that things would have changed in that five years. Look back on the last five years, Sarah, and how the world has changed. And it's likely as we embrace AI and global audiences and all the different things that are coming down the line. So those leaders and those senior people need that space. And I actually love creating that because having been there myself and knowing the joy that that brings, but the isolation and disconnect that that can bring as well. You can just see where people let down their guard and they can have a real true conversation about what matters to them. And it's not easy and it is difficult and change is difficult, but there are real benefits. And I think we're we're seeing much more that the need for that empathetic leader. And when it comes to recruitment, especially with younger generations Mm. coming through now, they're very much choosing the organisation that they want to work for. Um, And, you know, if you don't meet their values or the culture that they want to work within, then they go somewhere else. So true. I mean, expectations in the workplace are really high now. And I think that's um, that's a challenging thing as well, because, you know, we have to have these conversations that still allow people to be held accountable. Workplace well-being and coaching isn't about not having the difficult conversations. It's also not um, about holding people to account and making sure the performance is good yeah but if you are as a leader and a manager confident in your own role that your mental health is strong that your nervous system is regulated you're much more likely to be able to hold that space for others and then that's whenever you can see the ripple effect of that across teams and it's so powerful to watch people navigating that journey and to see the positive outcomes so you've branched out, you've become an entrepreneur, um, you've built this fabulous, successful business with the three strands that you've been telling us about. Is it just you? How do you do it all? <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose in terms of delivery and content, yes, that is me. And maybe I'm a little bit precious about that because mm. I am a storyteller and the stuff that I write is about the lived experience that I've had over the last 20 years. So nobody else does have that. I mean, they might have a similar evidence base. They might have explored the same courses and personal development that I've had. But I feel they don't deliver it like I would, just like I wouldn't deliver it as someone else would as well. Um. Back office wise, I do have support for things like finance, admin and website, social media stuff. And that's on a freelance basis. And that's lovely because I'm able to work with people who get the well-being pathway, get the, the ethos of the business and associate model work is really important to me Sarah I collaborate with a lot of amazing people in Northern Ireland and beyond and that frees up a bit more capacity for me because if you can imagine if I'm in a consultancy role within an organization and they're serious about well-being they maybe want to focus on things like mental health resilience leadership great that I'm in there but they also maybe want to look at physical activity financial well-being um, other things that I don't have an expertise in but I do know excellent people and that's a win-win for the organisation because they're getting the whole package without having to go and look for people because I'm bringing that recommendation in. But also for me as um, a business, I can offer that whole package to them and I can also provide associates with work and experience as well. Yeah, and I think we're seeing more of that, aren't we, in that sort of freelance yeah. world that the associate model is working so well for entrepreneurs who, let's face it, maybe don't want to take on staff <laughs> <laughs> well that's really good that you said that I wasn't sure yeah. if I would be clear in that or not yeah. do you know what I, I haven't ruled that out um and it's, it's interesting because the business is still developing organically yes. just in terms of you know where I am going but 
that was one of the biggest challenges, even though when I was in senior leadership roles, I had amazing teams, fantastic people who always went the extra mile. You know, it only takes one or two people maybe to not be in that same space. It can suck up so much of your time and your energy and have that negative ripple effect across other Mm -hmm. teams as well. And particularly now in the changing world of legislation, you know, employment law, all of the expectations that are out there. I'm not just sure at the minute whether I want to go down that route, but the associate model really lends itself because it gives me social interaction as well. You know, entrepreneurship is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's liberating. It's free. But it's also lonely sometimes. So it's really nice to have that connection with other people who are on my wavelength and are trying to achieve the same outcomes as I am. And so networks are very important. I know that uh, you're an associate consultant with the Health and Social Care Leadership Centre and a mentor in women in business. How have you found that whole mentoring experience? And have you been mentored yourself? Yeah, Yeah. I love mentoring. Um, Women in business has been fantastic and also Sisters In. um, Amazing. Fantastic. Just tell people about Sisters In if they don't know. So Sisters In, um, obviously bringing together these amazing young women through our schools in Northern Ireland and it is just so, so powerful and they get that opportunity to be mentored by someone um, usually associated to maybe their career pathway or something that they want to achieve themselves but also as a mentor, you're connecting with other mentors mentors you're sharing that stage and that space with the, those young people they teach you so much as well so you're open up up your mindset but it's just that I suppose recognition that it's a, a challenging space out there for young females coming through in leadership roles but it's so many more opportunities than when I was a, a young woman in terms of trying to navigate where do you fit what does that look like and where are the role models for you to look up to so I just feel that whole mentoring networking experience is so invaluable and you just never know when you have that cup of tea cup of coffee sit beside someone stand at a stand in a, in a conference centre and have a conversation where that's actually going to lead and it has taken me in places over the last three and a half years that I never dreamed I'd be. So whenever you're mentoring do you prefer to mentor women young women? It's just worked out that way I think yeah Um, I mean I suppose in Sisters Inn there was young women there in women in business it has has been females. That space is something that you know that you can add value. Yeah I I can add value and also I've just recently um, I developed a a program uh, called Your Time to Shine in partnership with Shimna Integrated College so I developed the program and we're working with year 13 girls there and there's 20 of them and I'll tell you they should be up there running Stormont they are on rail. So what do you do in that then? So we have a monthly session there and we look at things like um, you know what does entrepreneurship mean what does leadership mean for females in this society how to look after your own self-care and well-being what does social media look like from a power um, perspective rather than some of the negative narrative particularly Mm. for younger people but I've I've not been able to do that myself I've had to bring in fantastic fantastic collaborators so you know people like Jacqueline Hamilton and Nicola McGuinness, Stacey Murta, other women in entrepreneurship roles across my networks who can help me to do that work. And it's hugely rewarding. It's fantastic we've got our celebration event in June and we're so excited about that. Yeah I mean I actually love working in that area as well. So diversity and inclusion as well it you know we've been putting a lot of work into making women feel more supported getting more women into well there's a big a big push to get more women into senior roles yeah. and then keeping them in those roles mm-hmm. so menopause is a, is a big I was going to say hot topic but yeah. you know what I mean yeah. and and it's somewhere that you feel you can add value yeah. also yeah and I think it's that connection again between menopause and workplace well-being because you know <laughs> I, I have reflected on this as somebody who's on that journey mm. and you know there's it's amazing that there's a higher profile around speaking about perimenopause and menopause but also there's a bit of a negative narrative I sometimes mm-hmm. think about if you just have a sweeping statement about you know the menopause is such a challenging time for all women and they're going to leave the workplace in droves and it's really really awful for society. I get that that is the case for some people, but there's also so much more transformation, Mm. opportunity, a sense of your own resilience and ability to own the space that you're in. And I think that's where I love to add value in, in, in workplaces. So it's not so much about just developing a workplace policy on menopause, but what does that actually look like? You know, how are you speaking about ageism? How are you speaking about sexism? How are you valuing the lived experience of women, not just in the roles that they play within work, but how have they lived their lives, whether they've been a mom, a community navigator, a volunteer, and how are you bringing that out in the workplace rather than just 
always thinking of somebody in a job role. So it's just so interesting and powerful to have those conversations. And I think it definitely we need more research around it. Yeah. I mean, why are women leaving? Is it, you know, oh, we can't cope? Or is it more, as you say, that transformation is also happening? Yeah. Yes, caring is mm-hmm. a big thing and you might have children but you also maybe have elderly parents at that time and there's a lot going on and you and I both maybe stepped out of of our careers when we were more mature let's say um for transformation reasons but not necessarily just because of menopause yeah exactly and that's the thing you know if if you're struggling um with symptoms and living with you know perimenopause menopause and you feel you're able to put up your hand and ask for help. Yeah. That's a really powerful thing within Absolutely. the workplace. Mm-hmm. But also, if you um, are listening to the narrative that this is the end of your womanhood and the end of your ability to transform, that's not the place that I want to be in. I want to show people that there is, you know, another way. There's so many more things that you can do. And it's maybe not just about leaving work, but other things that you can actually develop and thrive on as a woman as well. Tell us about your book. So you've also, um, you know, written that book, which is just an incredible achievement. I think anybody that's actually (laughs) managed to produce and publish a book, then I take my hat off to you. But what was that experience like and what's the response been? Well, it was a fantastic experience, but procrastination is a thief of time, (laughs) as one of my old old teachers used to tell me. And I have about five manuscripts in my laptop, Sarah, that I've started. I suppose the belief system part of that as well. Now, they were all... um, um, fiction books but wisdom of well-being so I'd been thinking about okay how can I get the messages out there of the people that I've met over the years but also connect that with the business and the fact that I love telling stories so I thought okay let's put this into some sort of a, a space so I was initially thinking of maybe doing some blogs around that or writing some articles and then one of my friends said well you've been talking about writing a book for years why not just do it so the way that worked for me was seeking out a publisher um, Orla Kelly Publishing in the South of Ireland because I needed somebody to hold me to account I needed somebody to give me deadlines that I had to work to. I get that. <laughs> uh, that was the only way I could do it. And honestly, Sarah, it was fantastic. So the way I framed the book was it's an A to Z. So it looks at things like acceptance, belonging, creativity, dreams. So I've written a story, a true story of someone that I have either met, worked with or supported through my life. Then I have written a poem to support that story. And then I've created some space for reflective practice. So the day that I held that first copy Um, in my hand was a day I will never forget and then I had my launch uh, in December 2022 with my mum my dad my family my friends all there it was fantastic that book has been amazing it has gone all over the world and when I stood in Manhattan just before Christmas um, in a stage with um, all of these other women from Irish America sitting there listening to me reading out of my book it was one of those pinch me moments thinking what has happened here how have I actually got to this stage and how did you get to Manhattan with it so networking connections um, sat in Sandy Mount Hotel in Dublin and met a lovely woman called Sam Kelly from Wexford the tweeting goddess if you've ever seen her on social media she made a call to a guy in Manhattan, Jim Frawley, just who there and one, then. one of my TEDx speakers, oh, yeah. who then connected me with other people. And then I got invitations to go to New York. So that all came about with virtual platforms, becoming real life interactions, becoming friendships, becoming connectors and me heading over the Atlantic. And what did that do for the inner critic and the imposter syndrome? What did that do at the time to you? Was that challenging or did you say, listen, inner critic, yeah. thanks very much, but mm-hmm. I'm taking this. <laughs> I did say what you just said there yeah. because I think, again, as a mentor and a coach, I have a mentor and a coach because I think that is fundamental. You can only grow and develop if you have someone else to be that sounding board because you can get comfortable and you can get stuck in your own um, zone there. And you can also be, particularly when you run your business and there's an element of success there, the ego can take over and you can sometimes think, oh yeah, I'm just so wonderful here. And then whenever things... Are you reading my thoughts? (laughs) When things don't go to plan, of course, oh my God, sure, why? Of course you you were were going to fail. Now, alongside that, over the last year, I've done a lot of work um, around positive intelligence intelligence and the training around mindset and, and, and um, brain exercises which have been really powerful but no I, I loved it Sarah I thought I am going to just go here and embrace it was I nervous yes was I thinking oh my goodness here I am from rural county down standing in midtown Manhattan but you know what we are all 
human beings connect with each other. And I have worked with women in New York who one of them, their last year's bonus was $2.2 million. And yet when we had those conversations, the things that she was struggling with were imposter syndrome, fitting into the leadership team, wanting to carve out a work-life balance that she was really struggling with within the hustle of New York. So if that... Feeling, do I deserve this? Am I do worthy? I deserve this? Yeah. Am I up to this? Yeah. So we Goodness. are all worthy. It's just how we find that ability to change that inner narrative to something that's really, really positive and feeds our soul, our mind and our body every single day. And you have to work at it every single day. I'm so interested about what you've said there. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit about the brain training. Yeah. Um, can you give us some advice or tips around that? So I suppose it's just around, um, I mean, the course was really interesting. It was a lot of commitment. Um, so they talked about our PQ muscle and the fact that, you know, how we exercise our brain is every bit as important as how we exercise our body. So, you know, and I know you do this, your yoga, your walks out in nature. I mean, I look at you up on the beach <laughs> in Port Royce. I'm really lucky in rural County Down, beautiful places as well. But we feel that strength in our body. We feel that ability to move. We feel if we maybe get, you know, a cold or a flu or something that... We with a little bit of rest and a little bit of movement, mm. we can get back on. But we forget sometimes that our brain is a muscle and that if we don't exercise that, that, you know, that can become really stagnant as well. So it takes us through the ability to connect what's going on in our mind with our body and how the rigidity of muscle can affect not just this movement, but what we're actually thinking in our thought processes as well. And when we practice those, and some of them are five minutes, three times a day, so it can be related to that course that I did, Breathe, Laugh, Relax. That's my next question, yes. Well, Sarah, that's all connected because the way we breathe, and I mean, even coming in here today, I was nervous, mm. but because I've had that um, course and some support that I'm getting with a wonderful woman, Patricia Martin at the moment, my ability to feel grounded and to start the conversation was just building that breathwork model. Again, that fits into what am I telling myself about this process today and how am I going to enjoy it alongside feeling that sense of nervousness bringing a bit of fun and laughter, which I know will always happen when, when I'm with you. But when I do that, I feel that regulation in my nervous system and that sense of peace and balance as if, well, what can go wrong? I mean, if we don't do this well today, that's fine. Nobody has know, died. And I love that. And it's all about the mind. It's all about the way you, the self-talk, the, yeah. you know, the, the adjustment that you need to do, yeah. the chiropractic adjustment from totally. a place of fear. What What's this all going to be? How bad is it going to go to... What if it goes really well yeah, today? Yeah. And I'm nervous when I come into the yeah, studio and yeah. I and I begin a conversation mm -hmm. and who's going to sit in front of me? But that, that what is it? This fear that yeah. takes over. I know. So I know. tell us, talk us through a, a breathing exercise then with breath, breathe, laugh and relax. So this uh, is a course that's been developed by the wonderful Michelle Major up in your neck of the woods. Have you ever heard of it? The Sunshine Project. She is amazing. If you haven't, check her oh, out. Oh, well. She's in Port Rush. North Coast. Okay. She is fantastic corporate finance background and I won't tell you all her story you no. should have her on the podcast I think we will um but this so the breathe laugh relax is all about our nervous system and how for a lot of um our training over life we're told to think our way out of stress out of trauma and to feel okay but obviously we can't do that just cognitively we have to experience that in our somatic system and that has been transformational over the last while in terms of even how I deliver my programs I wrote a program recently there for women um, surviving domestic violence and how I would have delivered that a year ago compared to how I deliver it now because it wasn't just about putting slides and evidence based up there it was about that experiential learning within the room connecting with those women supporting the regulation of their nervous system but in a way that was still keeping me in the space that I needed to feel connected with, with as well and I can bring that into senior leadership teams who are working in high I mean in the health service I've done some work in there with clinicians directors of services who are in that fight or flight all of the time mm. they're often not aware of how they're actually acting and reacting and how that's affecting their staff teams so it's so so powerful to connect those dots Gosh, I really must check that out. It sounds just right up my street. Um, you know, mental health, you've you've experienced your own challenges, uh, your husband also. Is this like a, you know, a form of therapy as well, this business for you? Do you feel that you learn and improve every day through the work that you do? 100%, Sarah. Um, I suppose therapy, I mean, I... 
I still, I have support every time I do particularly complex conversations. You know, I would have someone that I go to for support and supervision. I just think it keeps me focused. It keeps me um, up to date with the latest evidence base and it protects me as well. But there is real richness in listening to people's conversations and connecting the evidence base and the data that's out there, which is fantastic. But what does that actually look like in real life? How does that translate into people's lives? And I think sometimes we forget in the midst of all the busyness of life, you know, I hear people all the time saying, oh, whenever the children are bigger, whenever I get more money, whenever I retire, whenever, this is it here and now. And if we can find a way to bring that sense of strong mental health well-being practice into our daily life we will live each day and we will have ups and downs but we will always find moments of joy and an ability to thrive within those difficult times and I just feel everybody should have that and we're in a position of privilege that we're talking about that today I am really on a mission to try and connect that with the people in our communities who are not visible at the moment they're not Mm -hmm. able to connect with those offers of support they're maybe not financially in a place or they maybe don't even understand how they're living in um, a fight or flight experience every day of their lives which is hugely damaging and unsustainable yeah. and if anybody's listening to this now and I don't know is it just me or is, there's few people that say this to me post-covid yeah we never switch off. Mm-hmm. It feels like screens are on all of the time. We're just, as you say, the brain is always awake. I know the power of rest now. Mm-hmm. I really make an effort to try and make sure I get proper sleep and yeah. things like that. And But it's hard, isn't it? You're switched yeah. on all the time. Um, what advice would you give to people right now if you feel like, gosh, you know, I don't know if I can keep going mm-hmm. like this? Well, it's very easy to give advice. Um, I You mentioned toxic positivity earlier and I do <laughs> have a bit of a, a challenge with that in terms of there's a lot of advice out there that tells us to be resilient, mm. sh- sh- show up, switch off. How do you do that? Mm. You know, that's really hard for some people. Some but people can't relax. They can't. I mean, it, it has to come down to the small steps that are right for you. And it's so interesting now that I see, particularly in my line of work, a growing body of commentators, you know, around meditation, mindfulness, nature, hydration, nutrition, as if this is all new stuff. Mm. I mean, this is stuff that um, our ancestors and long before that were doing. And they were showing us the way because even though now we have so much more um, things at the switch of a finger, our lives are easier with all of the um, innovation and digital access mm. we have, but people aren't happier. So fundamentally, I would go back to the five ways to well-being. So connection, connection with yourself, knowing who you are, connecting with your breath, connecting with nature and connecting with other people, that power to just be with people and maybe forget them now. Take a notice Notice what are you listening to? What are you letting into your mind, body and soul? And if we're not aware of that, that can be things that are really damaging to us. Um, Keeping active. That doesn't have to be climbing the morns or swimming across the the sea. Gentle movement, however small that is, will help to regulate and create that sense of space. Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Get to the other ones. Um, Keep learning. Keep learning. Open your mind to new things challenge those beliefs that have been in your system and psyche Mm. all of those years and the next one is give so the power of gratitude and that's a really simple thing that people often overlook but when we actually give thanks for what we have we will find more things to be grateful for whereas the flip side of that Sarah which what we do a lot on social media when we look and compare ourselves to other people we'll see more lack in our lives so that power of gratitude really pulls those five ways to well-being together and every single day a moment of those will help to build those habits to leading a healthier life some brilliant uh, tips for everybody listening today um People can also tune into your podcast, so let's give that a bit of a plug. If you want to hear more from Catherine and tune in and and benefit from her years of experience and and what you can do to make changes in your life, tell us about the podcast. Wow. So the podcast, I have always listened to podcasts. Love that when I'm out walking. That's my go-to for keeping learning and I suppose connecting and nourishing my mind and, and, and soul with things that are really uplifting to me. And people have talked about you should do a podcast, particularly aligned to the book. And lo and behold, when you start to think about things, opportunities open up. And Granite Podcast Studio, where we are today, had a competition. And I looked at it and thought, well, there's no point applying for that because everybody will be in for that. And of course, flicked the narrative and said, well, why not? You know, you've got this book, you've got this idea. 
applied and won the podcast it competition. Was meant to be. <laughs> so that was amazing. So I came in, did the first series um, with women in our community around leadership and well-being. Second series, a bunch of great guys that I was a little bit nervous about from the world of rugby, GAA and football. Oh. But interestingly, all came back to family well-being, mental health and that sense of connection and I've just finished series three which was fantastic as well so absolutely love being uh, on the other side of the, <laughs> the mic but great to have people just to have those conversations as well and get those messages out there Sarah. So what's next for the well-being pathway if you're not busy enough Catherine? Well I love what I'm doing at the moment so I'm going to build on the, the good stuff there there's some CPD accreditation coming out for the core workshops. I think that will help to give that credibility to some organisations who want to invest, but also want to have that outcome for their staff to build that CPD portfolio, mm-hmm. which is really important. And also the associate model, I think, is something that's going to grow just as capacity is more limited for me, but that I want to get those messages out there. And the last thing which is coming up this year, on the back of TEDx last year and the success there, um, we're going to run um, an in-person event in the autumn time. It's going to focus on women's health and well-being. It's called Pause for Conversations. So there'll be a little bit of the menopause in there, but that power of pause on women just coming together in a safe, supported, fun space to learn about health and well-being in very simple and authentic conversations. So cannot wait for that to happen. Oh, I can't wait either. That sounds absolutely incredible. Well, you're incredibly busy, but you're smiling and you're you're happy. So that's all good. Final question. Same question to every guest that sits there. About the purpose of this podcast, which is to inspire existing business owners and ambitious entrepreneurs to grow their business by offering an insight into the success of businesses such as your well-being pathway. But what advice, Catherine, would you give to people who may have a business idea but have no idea where to begin or are unsure as to whether the risk is worth taking well I think the uncertainty and the fear of the risk that's that's always going to be there for most people but if you have something that you're really interested in you're passionate about and you want to either get that message out there or as a service or a product start to talk to other people who are currently in that space I was a wee bit nervous about that at the start because I thought people might see me as a competitor or someone that, you know, there's someone else coming into our space, but they were so open. And if you can get yourself somebody good that's going to give you good, clear, honest advice, mentoring as well. There's loads of free mentoring programs out there. You've mentioned women in business. There's lots of other um, smaller local based things through councils too. And also, I think just start talking about it because when you start talking about it, it is absolutely amazing where the opportunities on lie believe in yourself and take the first step because you mightn't succeed first time around loads of amazing fantastic famous people never did but just keep going with it and have fun along the way sarah thank you so much to Catherine mernan founder of the well-being pathway you can join me next time another fantastic episode of the public eye podcast to come this podcast was recorded in granite podcast studio Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service where our team, using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.